day. My name is Ernest Ngomoche and I am a researcher with Intellidex. Welcome to the final webinar in our series. It feels just like yesterday when we had the first webinar, bringing to the fore key lessons from successful entrepreneurs on how to build high growth businesses in South Africa. We started this wonderful series on the 2nd of September, and I hope that you agree that it has been a riveting series so far full of lessons. This webinar is part of the launch of a research report um, produced by Intellidex and funded by eSquared Investments. The report is available on our website, as well as recordings from past webinars. Just some background on the report itself. We took a more comprehensive approach to what makes successful, to what makes entrepreneurs successful. So we gleaned insights from the likes of the late Dr. Richard Mabonya, Jim, which is the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor. We also took some lessons from award-winning academics, um, as well as insights from the data analytics provider, CB Insights. Following from this, we then came up with our own conceptual framework in studying entrepreneurship with five questions in five categories. Firstly, we looked at the individual. We asked the entrepreneur about their individual journeys towards entrepreneurship and what attributes contribute towards entrepreneurial success. Secondly, we looked at the social context. We asked how founder networks, including their families, friends, and how the general community contributes towards entrepreneurial success. The third thing we considered, we considered was the business. We asked, which of the five key components of the business did the entrepreneur have to get right, um, such as timing, the team, the business model, and or funding? Fourthly, we looked at the industry. We asked how did founders navigate industry dynamics, competition, and stakeholder involvement in advancing their business? And lastly, we looked at the economy and asked how did the economy in any way influence the start of their entrepreneurial journey. By way of background, I'd like to ask Malik Fell from eSquared Investments to share the thinking and the rationale behind them commissioning this research. Malik, um, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Anes. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, for also, good afternoon. It's been a long time. So. Uh... Good afternoon, Malik. <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> Delighted to be here. So just quickly, uh, uh, Ernest, on, on our side, um, eSquare, first of all, stands for Excellence in Entrepreneurship. And uh, uh, what that means is that we have almost kind of a dual function uh, as, a, as an organization. On one hand, we are the uh, Alan Gray BE partner. So uh, that's kind of our, uh, almost our fiduciary function. But uh, we also use a, a, a significant portion of our resources to uh, support uh, South African entrepreneurs. We are, for, we are, we call our, we like to call ourselves a, a sort of a long-term impact impact fund, uh, particularly focused on uh, uh, fostering and supporting responsible and ethical entrepreneurs. And obviously, being part of the Alan Gray family, we sort of. Uh, uh, supports uh, primarily Alan Gray Fellows who are entrepreneurs. A, a portion of them, of the Alan Gray Fellows are entrepreneurs. There's about four, 500 of them now. And we, we have a special focus to support uh, these entrepreneurs who are coming out of the sort of Alan Gray fold. Um, with regard to why we commissioned this study, for us, uh, we sort of felt that it was important at, at sort of this point in time uh, to sort of uh, foster and promote the knowledge about what has made a successful entrepreneurs in South Africa uh, succeed despite you know many of the challenges that uh, people you know, we all know uh, are prevalent in the country. So our goal was not to do sort of a, a scientific study uh, uh, with a large sample and sort of uh, extremely statistical, statistically valid data, but to sort of more have almost like a, a sort of a, a fireplace uh, chat interviews with a number of successful entrepreneurs across the country and, uh, and sort of glean from those conversations insights, uh, advice, experiences that we felt might be useful to the broader entrepreneurial community. 
And so, uh, uh, so the themes that you evoke that uh, in which the, the report is structured were pretty much embedded in the conversations that uh, were held with, the, with the, the 25 entrepreneurs that were interviewed for this study. And so, uh, as you mentioned, we're now at the sort of the last theme that we're touching upon on uh, uh, you know, the, the role of the economy uh, in uh, either fostering or hampering entrepreneurs' uh, journeys. And we think it's a, it's a, a I'm very excited about this conversation, particularly given the context uh, that the country is in now with uh, uh, very, very challenging macroeconomic uh, conditions. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I'm looking forward to that conversation. I mean, the jury, the, the jury that I suppose is still out there. Some entrepreneurs uh, uh, have said that sometimes, uh, you know, the economic environment is not so relevant, hasn't been so relevant or, Either, either way in the success of their businesses and others feel strongly that uh, uh, it, is a, it is a hampering factor. So I think, uh, you know, uh, this discussion today hopefully is gonna, uh, you know, bring some, some added views on this sort of, I suppose, age long debate uh, around that. And so without further ado, let me sort of hand back to you Ernest and, uh, and, uh, and listen in. Thank you so much, uh, Malik. That was quite revealing um, in terms of background and history. Thanks so much for that. Um, today's guest, um, Polo Lete Karatebe, is the founder and chair of IDF Capital, uh, which provides appropriate financial and non-financial products and support to unlock value of and within the SME sector. Polo, welcome. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and to our audience, I'd like to say, please feel free to pose any questions to our guests during the session. Um, you can make use of the Q&A function. Um, we will monitor it um, and keep an eye on any questions that do flood in. Polo, I'm going to move into our first question for the day. Um, and this relates directly to IDF Capital, um, a business you founded and which you are currently uh, chair of. So when did it start? Um, and can you just give me a view of what the economy was like at the time? Um, thank you very much, uh, Ernest. I'm, I'm really honored to, to be invited to what I think is a very important and timely uh, conversation. Uh, and I do look forward to engaging with yourself uh, as well as uh, uh, your audience. And then I'm very excited to see my old friend uh, Malik uh, uh, featured here. Uh, so this is good all around. Um, we started IDF Capital uh, officially in 2008. I mean, we had actually been working on the idea uh, or the concept uh, before that, but in terms of the official launch was in March 2008. And um, the problem we were trying to solve, uh, because I, I think that every business exists to solve a problem. So um, you know, we, we, we uh, saw a problem in the market where we actually saw an opportunity in the market uh, which was prevented from being exploited due to the problems we saw in the market as well. And the opportunity was really um, at the time informed or brought about rather by uh, the policy decisions that our government had taken at the time around uh, broad-based black economic empowerment, whose main purpose was to mainstream uh, black entrepreneurs and, and black women entrepreneurs or rather black people into the economic mainstream across the board. Uh, and I was in, in particular interested in the entrepreneurial element of that policy. So what the policy essentially did is, is it, it unlocked opportunity for this uh, market grouping that had previously been precluded from being active participants in the economy. Uh, and opening up supply chains for them to start uh, being part of those supply chains and therefore, ex you know, um, um, exploring business opportunities. And the problem, uh, Ernest, at the time was that our financial services sector then and to, to an extent had never really had to deal with, uh, formally deal with black entrepreneurs uh, where they had dealt with them, their requirements. Uh, could not be met uh, because typically your finance, financiers would look for things like track record, uh, business plan, uh, and whatever other collateral that they would look for. And 
uh, as you can imagine, this, this grouping was coming into the mainstream of the economy for the first time, and they didn't have probably 80% of what the financial services institutions were looking for. So that was the problem we were trying to solve. Uh, we felt that there's certainly no shortage of capital in the South African economy. Uh, and we also felt that there, there was no shortage of, of business opportunities. Uh, but for us to be able to tap into those business opportunities, they, they could only be unlocked through the provision of an appropriate support system, which would come in the form of funding, but also other business support uh, services. So essentially building an ecosystem that is supportive to unlocking this, this economic potential. So that's really what we came into the market and said, we want to almost intermediate, if you will. So we became the middleman where we would um, go to your investors and, and try and articulate the investment case for directing capital into this asset class that they were not accustomed to, uh, which they thought was highly risky and uh, the quickest way to lose money. So trying to articulate it in a language and a format that your traditional institutional investors could relate to and understand, and also go to this market, which we are from, we are part of it, we look like it, we speak like it, but we also understand the language of the holders of capital, and we felt that we would be a, a good intermediary. And that's really, in the main, uh, what we were trying to solve. And we, we, we seem to solve the problem of access to capital. Okay. So that's really a good way of putting it, but, but that's what it entails. Um, now, you asked me about what the economy was. We couldn't have picked a, a worse time to start a business. Uh, this was exactly. <laughs> This was in 2008 uh, when uh, the global economic crisis hit us, um, uh, which meant a lot of things. It, it meant that, again, the owners of capital, because they had lost you know, investments, especially on your major stock exchanges, uh, mm -hmm. they, they started being very careful about where they put their money. And as you can imagine, the SME asset class was already a swear word but you, you, we were starting to see some money being driven into that space. And then when the global crisis hit, they were the first ones to, 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 to be uh, negatively affected or the, ones who, the first ones to be deprived of any additional funding because investors were all, all, almost looking for sure bets where they knew that their money would be preserved and grown as opposed to getting, putting their money into risky uh, asset classes. So it was certainly not a sexy asset class at the time. Uh, and you also then saw, although South Africa, to a large extent, uh, or rather relatively speaking, uh, was not as, as hard hit as the rest of the global economy, directly at least. But when you think about it, um, you know, our major customers are international, you know, uh, they're, they're international and, and they are countries, uh, you know, the US is one of our largest economic partners or trade partners. Europe uh, is, is one of our largest trade partners. And of course, China. Uh, as well. But Europe and uh, the US were probably the hardest hit uh, economies, meaning that the guys who consumed the most of what we produce as a country, uh, their financial situation had deteriorated, meaning that their, their demand for our goods and services as a producer uh, or as a supplier rather of, of those goods and services uh, diminished, um, which then of course then indirectly then would trickle down into how our own economic performance uh, panned out as a country. And, 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 and all of these factors, which may feel very, very removed from us as entrepreneurs or as, as local people, unfortunately, invariably do ultimately reach our pockets as well. So you then started seeing that, you know, uh, part, parts of our economy struggling quite a bit. Uh, I think at the time, your manufacturing sector in particular was very badly hit because, uh, we, you know, we, we produce with a view of exporting and, and, and therefore the export market was very badly uh, hit. And, and what that then that does mean is that it, it has got a, a supply chain or rather a value chain impact. So people who are suppliers into that supply chain of that manufacturer, of course, invariably uh, get hit. And what that means is that typically your small uh, businesses are the ones who are part of those supply chains. So if the, if, if the big brother is affected, then yeah. you know, the, the small guys get affected. And, and that's what it then also meant for us as people looking to invest in the SME space to, 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 to try and convince the world that these guys who we know would probably be hit hardest because they are small and they don't have as many reserves say as their big brothers. Uh, we started a business within that context where everybody was like, we are not touching that. So it was quite an interesting time to start a business and we had very interesting conversations. Yeah. And I think it, it taught us 
I think it taught us to be very clear in our minds about what the value proposition was. You know, it, it forced, not that it wasn't very clear, but I think when everything is moving up, uh, you can get away with a lot of, you know, waffling. But I think when, you know, uh, a rand is chasing a, a lot of opportunities or, or, or a few rands are chasing a lot of opportunities, um, you are required as a, an entrepreneur to really sharpen uh, your value proposition to, you know, your targeted, uh, whether it's your targeted clients or your targeted uh, investors. And that's really what we had to then sharpen uh, that very early on in, 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 at the beginning of our life uh, as a business. I think this is a very fascinating story on the, the formation of IDF Capital. And, you know, I just want to juxtapose what happens 13 years ago with the 2008 economic crisis with, you know, the COVID-induced um, one. So I just want to get your view. How, how do you think that COVID has in turn, you know, sidetracked budding entrepreneurs who were on the brink of launching into whatever markets they were launching into? or who had actually just started and, you know, their businesses were still in a very embryonic phase. So how would you say that this crisis that we're in has, has hampered, you know, their, their growth and ability to get into the market? So I think, you know, that the current situation is, it's not exactly the same as the 2008. I mean, the 2008 one, firstly, it was not immediate and direct. Uh, we, we almost, um, were impacted by almost the, the reverberations, rever whatever you call it in, in English, so sort of like the, you know, whatever then ultimately reached us much later on after the, the actual uh, crisis hit the, the world. So we, we almost had a time, if you will, to prepare ourselves, if you can never prepare yourself for anything like that. I think COVID, uh, even though it started in China, I don't know whether anyone thought that we would have to close the economy for six months, as an example. So it was, it was uh, the, the effect of COVID was immediate. Like the day we said we're closing business or we're closing the economy, people started feeling the impact immediately and, and severely, right? So it was not gradual. No, it was immediate, it, it was severe. And depending on which sector of the economy you were in, so the level of severe, se severity was also dependent on what type of business you're running or what kind of problem you're trying to solve. And when you, when you look at, uh, you know, businesses like, for instance, businesses in tourism, because the world stopped moving, right, both internationally as well as locally, those businesses by their nature are informed by people movement. So a lot of tourism businesses literally closed doors and many of them are never going to open those doors, right, unless they get a, a, a kickstart a, a funding of sorts and then and, and, and they are yeah. able to that the, the process. So, so, so I, I think that COVID has been immediate and it has been severe in its, you know, in the extent of its impact. But what has also been interesting to observe, and it's a very important thing, what has been interesting to observe is businesses in what we call essential services. So things we cannot do without, you know, like you cannot do without water, you cannot do without electricity, you cannot do without uh, bathing, uh, going to the toilet, um, using products, cosmetic products, right? Essential cosmetic products. You cannot do without medicine. Those businesses actually thrived uh, during COVID. Um, and, and what it then said to me is, okay, so there are economic downturn proof businesses or business models, both businesses and business models actually. So businesses in terms of the product that you are selling. So, so for me, that was a very interesting uh, thing. What was also interesting by the way is Healthcare uh, is, is said to be an essential service. However, what we saw right at the beginning, because of fear of contracting the virus, this very sector, which is right at the center of essential services, actually saw a significant uh, contraction because people were not willing to go to the doctor's rooms uh, for fear of, 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 you know, because that's probably where it's, it's most concentrated. But what we then started seeing was almost a pivoting of the healthcare business model, where we started seeing a lot of um, uh, telemedicine uh, ideas come into market. So people moved from physical uh, consultation to virtual con uh, consultation using telemedicine. And the guys who had already been working on telemedicine solutions actually started seeing sig significant traction in their businesses. And, and, and this is important because from a policy perspective, 
the, 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 the regulatory environment has not been supportive. In fact, I think it precluded the use of telemedicine or at least inhibited it quite significantly. And what COVID has done is it has said it doesn't matter what the regulatory environment says. <laughs> this is what we need, you know. So it has almost accelerated the adoption of telemedicine, whether our regulators liked it or not. And we saw the same thing with e-learning, you know, where there has been a lot of, you know, pushing by people in the edutech space to say, you know, now that we've got technology, you don't have to physically to go into a classroom and sit down and listen to a guy or a, a girl teaching you stuff. You can actually do this from the comfort of your home or, you know, just using your device. And, we, and, and the adoption was there, but it was slow. And what we saw happen during COVID is literally an acceleration of the adoption of those kinds of uh, platforms. So, so if that then talks to the business model. We also saw, uh, again, we had already started seeing the move towards, uh, you know, away from physical uh, shopping to online shopping, or at least a, a mix of online and physical shopping, but still skewed in the main towards uh, physical shopping because, you know, we want to see, feel, touch. Uh, that's, that's how we are. And we don't always trust, you know, you know uh, using our banking things on, on, on the internet. And all of a sudden, when you thought of going to a shopping center and potentially catching the disease, you would rather take the risk of buying your groceries online. And we saw, I mean, you know, we, we are invested in, we were invested in, in one of the, the online uh, apps, uh, shopping apps uh, for groceries, um, uh, one of the, the first movers actually in the country. And I remember right at the beginning, they had to go through a massive recruitment of buyers because the demand for their, you know, their, their services just shot the roof. I mean, they, they were not coping for the first uh, month. Uh, they just didn't know what to do with the demand. Uh, you know, so, so we saw those kinds of things. So what, it, what this time has done, oh, and, and one other thing that I thought was quite fascinating is, you know, one of the areas that we've invested in over the years has been in the fuel, re retail fuel station space. And what we, we, we saw during 2008 and, and even during other sort of economic downturn times uh, over the past 13 years, was that no matter how bad the, that the economy was doing, your, your fuel stations did, you know, they performed the, the same consistently throughout because people have to move all the time, people have to go to work, people have to transport goods and services. So that was always our mainstay. So we used to say that, look, if all else fails, at least we know that we can preserve our capital through fuel stations. Guess what? They saw, you know, re reductions uh, in activity of up to 80 to 70 to 80 percent. Uh, during the first uh, two months of, 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 of lockdown. So even the most resilient sectors were very severely impacted uh, during uh, this lockdown period. And I think for us as investors, uh, we, we, we of course are much more knowledgeable today than we were six months ago in terms of, you know, what do you look for when you look at a resilient business across any or throughout any economic cycle? Very, very important. What we also learned was the importance of building reserves as an entrepreneur, because a lot of the guys who could potentially have completely had to close shop were able to sustain themselves based on the reserves they were able to build before COVID. Now, you ask the question, so how has this impacted on, on someone who was starting out? Unfortunately, the guys who would have been a few months in, in the game, we all know when you start a business, very cash hungry. So you actually don't even have the option of building any reserves, right? At, the, mm. at that point, because you're just guzzling cash. Your business is guzzling cash all the time. So when you don't have reserves, and it, it unfortunately means that you are very, very exposed. And so I think for me, one of the most important lessons was the importance of being very deliberate about building reserves as soon as you can, right? Building reserves as soon as you can so that when you go through these bumps that invariably will come across, you at least have got some reserves to carry you through those difficult times. But also what we saw was uh, the businesses that we have invested in because of the type of relationship we have with them. Immediately when they, you know, when, when the announcement of closing down of the economy was made, we immediately sent out a survey to say, okay, guys, how do you think this is going to impact you, right? And then others said, no, we, we have got enough cash for seven days, 30 days or whatever. And we might have to fire a few people. We might have to close down temporarily and things like that. What that did is it helped us to be proactive in seeing how to support those businesses so that they can stay afloat during 
that period of time and be able to restart post COVID so that we don't see closures. So the importance of having very good relations with your funders yeah. is very, very important because we're able to have those conversations with businesses that we have very regular and close working relations with and where we are investors in particular or where we're funders. And I think that is important, uh, the, you know, the, the, the understanding the need to have very good relations with your financiers, whether it's a, your banker, whether yeah. it is an investor like us or any other, you know, person of support within the, the ecosystem. I think it is very, very important because that's where you, you, you go to in your hour of need. And I think that's where you are likely to get the most support during these uh, difficult uh, times. Thank you so much, uh, Polo. I just want to move back just a bit. Um, so you, you, you mentioned just how investors were somewhat averse, even in as early as 2007 and eight. And I just, I just wonder, how does policy uncertainty cripple you know, investor confidence, um, especially in the moment that we're in, with regards to ongoing policy uncertainty even SA even, even now. <laughs> How would you say that that is in turn hampering, you know, entrepreneurship? You know, uh, I mean, firstly, the role of policy is to, to provide an enabling regulatory framework, right? Okay. Enabling being a very key component of that definition and an enabling framework. And it enables by being timely, right? So making policy statements at the right time to unlock real blockages at the right time is very, very critical. So timing and relevance is very, very important to enable. Um, and what it also does is certainty as an investor, and, and I learned this from international investors many years ago, and they said to me that if I'm sitting in Europe, Polo, and I'm trying to determine uh, if um, the billions of dollars that I have or that I'm managing, whether I'm putting them in Russia, whether I'm putting them in Angola, whether I'm putting them in the US, whether I'm putting them in England, wherever in the world, the first thing that I look at is what is the regulatory environment? What is the regulatory regime? What are the laws, right? And if you are an investor, what you understand is that everything that, um, whether it's regulatory or it's how things are done in that particular geography, you, you literally translate that into rents and cents. So if there is a policy um, on black economic empowerment, what does that mean for my business? Right? Does it mean I'm going to, if I have to hire black people, do they exist? Do they have the skills? Do I have to train them? If I don't hire them, what does it mean for me? Right? And you almost do a cost benefit analysis. That's what such a policy certainty does. So the absence of policy means that, and this is, and they, they use these terms, they said, I don't want to invest in a country where I don't know what my cost of investment is. Mm. Right? Because I then don't know what my return on investment is going to be. And they made very practical examples around about economies that are run on a brown paper bag kind of, you know, <laughs> where it seems to be cheap. So I invite you as the prime minister of this country and I say, oh, come on, my friend, bring your foreign direct investment into my country. Don't worry about uh, this policy and that policy. We will, you know, we will support you. And then you come into the, po the, the country and then you know, now the prime minister is expecting you to, you know, pay for the Bentley and the this and the that and the other. And then you only discover once you've made the investment in that country that, oh, geez, oh, so it's going to cost me a four million rand Bentley or it's going to cost me uh, so much money in paying private school fees for this person's children, whatever. So, so, so that's how investors look at investing in countries. They literally say, what are the rules? What, what is it going to cost me? They do a cost benefit analysis. So investors don't like going into economies where there's a policy uncertainty, if the, in the case that they do, mm. they put a very big premium on their pricing, right? Meaning then that they also then become very selective about what in your country they're going to invest in. Uh, but then their expected return is so much higher, higher that actually for you as a country, potentially it's not worth your while because all the benefit is likely to be taken out by your international investors. So I think we need to understand 
the role of economic policy. So if, if it does not enable, then it's useless. Um, you know, things like in this particular context of, of where we are today, and this was really brought to bear by the closing of the economies. We, we woke up one day, we, we realized that we needed PPE, right? Um, during this COVID period, and we closed the country and you said we we're not going to be buying anything from outside and we had no choice but to go to China and uh, get PPE. Why? Because no local capability. Our supply chains have not been developed to produce the quanti quantity and the quality of PPE that we need during these times of crisis. Now, every, if you've read enough on COVID, they're saying, oh, this is just one of many waves we're going to see. So it means we're going to have you know, other strings that come along which may require us to close the country. So are we going to be going to China each time? So, so we have been talking as a country about local procurement for a very long time. Uh, but when you look at it from a policy perspective, there has never been a very definitive policy document that says, as a country, we will mm. only procure or we will procure at least, say, 50% from locals and then the rest we can procure internationally. What that does is it gives certainty to us as local entrepreneurs that, okay, if I produce, if I build the capacity, I go and invest yeah. in plant and equipment and buy a building or land or whatever, uh, although I might not make profits maybe from year one because it's a long dated kind of investment, I'll make my profits in from year eight onwards. At least I have got some level of comfort that what I produce, my government or the local economy will procure. Now, when you have, you know, you, you, you've let it loose as we have as a country and we've, we've said that, you know, the, you know be, the best, be the best price win. It means because we know that we are not likely to produce uh, at the best price because you can always find these things cheaper, especially from China. There's no incentive for me as a local South African to go and put up a plant which will create jobs, which co will contribute towards GDP uh, because I've got no certainty or any level of comfort that there's a chance that what I produce will be uh, uh, manufactured. And now here we are exposed. Now, as a country, I think we need to be decisive about things like that. We've spoken about uh, the need for local procurement. Let's make it a policy and it becomes a requirement and not, because now we've just made it a broad you know, statement, oh, we wish people could, and we, we enter into all manner of what we call social accords. Social accords are useless because they cannot be enforced, right? So make it a law. Then that is how you're going to ensure security of supply when things like this happen. As a country, we need to be self-sufficient. Right now, we are too exposed. We are not self-sufficient. So I think those are the things that um, happen in, in, in an environment of level yeah. Certainty, yeah. certainty. I just want to take a few questions from the Q&A section, uh, Bulo. And the first one is from Sipo PM. Um, and he's asking your views on the current levels of inclusivity and diversity uh, in SA's economy. What's working and what desperately needs to change? And how can investors such as E squared, IDF, IDF Capital and others work together to hack the deficits? Okay, and now that's a very difficult question. I mean, it's an important question, um, but it's difficult because it also can be very subjective, right? Uh, so I'm going to try and and be as objective as possible. So I think please do. Yeah, the, the, the levels of I mean, we we are very far from it. Yeah, the the Gini coefficient says we we are the the most unequal society. Unequal. Yeah, we are the most unequal society in the world. So you know, and that's a fact. You know, whether you you want to put a racial um, uh, connotation to it or not, uh, the reality is that we are across class, across race, across gender. We are very unequal. So the, the answer is that, that we, we, we are not inclusive. I mean, you know, um, and inclusivity is an important concept, by the way, uh, because inclusivity uh, assumes that um, when I'm included, I feel safe. I feel heard, I feel seen, I feel relevant, right? Mm. It's not about whether there are, because, you know, according to our statistics uh, and population demographics, eight out of 10 South Africans are African and then maybe 
four out of 10 are um, Indian and another maybe six out of 10 are colored or nine out of 10 actually are colored and then another four or five out of 10 are white. It doesn't mean when you've got 10, room in the, 10 people in the room and you've got that kind of equation that you say we're inclusive, no, no, no. It just means that, we, that there's racial representation, absolutely. But if then what we do, how we do it is informed by how the four out of 10, or rather the four out of 100, not, what did I say, whatever. In a four out of 100, not, not 10. So if the four out of 100 inform what the other 96 out of 100 have to do, because they happen to have better economic um, you know, tools and, and, and opportunities, then that is not inclusivity. It just means that we've got enough people, we've, we've got representativity, but it's not inclusivity. So inclusivity for me is then about when we are in the room, do we feel that what is happening, what is being done, how it is being done, what is being said is representative of all of us or is as re representative and therefore as reflective rather of all of us as is possible. And I, I often make the very probably stupid example of saying that uh, when you look at Sunad Bank and they will forgive me if it, uh, any people from Sunad Bank and it's not a criticism, just you know how I think about it. So, so, so Sunad Bank, when you walk through Sunad Bank, I mean, it, it, you can, argue that, um, in fact, most of the, fund, of the banks, let me not even use Standard Bank as an example, when you walk through most of the banks in South Africa today, in the main, you see black people everywhere, right? So when you see that, you will then be um, uh, forgiven to think that, oh, absolutely, this is an African bank or whatever. And I always say, but when you are in the boardrooms, what are you wearing? You're wearing a gray suit with a tie and a shirt in Africa. Where we, we, I mean, our, our temperatures are very high, hot. Why are we wearing gray uh, suits and navy uh, blue suits and uh, black suits in Africa when actually our climate requires us to be wearing light uh, cloths uh, in order to, you know, for ventilation and for us to keep cool, right? So, what it means is that our corporate culture is very Western, it's informed by the four out of 100 and, you know, not reflective of what the other 96 actually know should be the case. So, so that's one way of looking at inclusivity. It's also about um, just around you, what is on your walls? You know, is it about, you know, what Europeans think is important or is it reflective of who we are and where we are and, and what we do, our artwork, you know? So for me, inclusivity is a, is a very layered and, and, and deep issue. And, and sometimes I think we talk about it very superficially. It's not about black and white, it's about what then does this all mean for all of us as a group? Uh, and so I, I think we're very far from there because we don't have those conversations, uh, Sipo. I think we, we, we shy away from them. We are uncomfortable having them, but we should have those conversations in order for us to get to a level of inclusivity. Okay, thanks for that, Polo. Just a, a quick question. So we got the stats essay figures on unemployment just yesterday. Um, and, I just want to find out what do you think we could be doing? How, how do you think the private sector and you know the public sector could be working together to to curb um, unemployment, which has also been accelerated by by, by the COVID nineteen crisis? So, so um, we 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 have to have a multi pronged strategy, uh, NST. But uh, multi pronged doesn't mean it's complex. It just means we have to do a number of things. There's no one panacea, you know, of all these ills. Yeah. We need to do a, a number of things. One of the things that uh, the numbers, I haven't read yesterday's numbers, but I read the ones that they released about two months ago, where they showed that uh, the people that were most impacted upon from an unemployment perspective were Black women. Mm. What that, it, it, it exposed a number of things. Um, it firstly said that we need to pay closer attention to the situation of women okay. in terms of their, 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 their mainstreaming into the economy, right? Women and black women in particular. Um, what I mean by that is we found that the guys who lost their jobs were in what we call community services or social services. So the domestic workers, the cashiers, the petrol attendants, the waiters, right? 
uh, and, and similar. Well, because women tend to occupy those spaces now, what it means is that although we were seeing an increase in the number of women being employed, the types of or the quality of the jobs they were getting into meant that they would be the first ones to be negatively affected when things like COVID come. So we need to be, we need to very urgently attend to that and say, how do we retool and reskill uh, women to give them the technical skills that they need so that they are represented across the various uh, sectors, uh, what in, in my space we will call diversifying your risk. How do we diversify the risk of women being always the most negatively impacted upon by economic uh, um, you know, outcomes, right? Because even in 2008, although women were not at the tables of making economic decisions, they were made by men at Lehman Brothers, but women are the ones who bought the brunt of those bad economic decisions. Similarly, I'm not saying that men are to blame for COVID, uh, but the downturn of the economy due to COVID affected women the most and black women the most because they are then, black women are at the bottom uh, of, of the, the food chain. They've always been and, and we, we still are and, and we can change that. So, so we learned that and, and this is a simple thing to solve. I mean, it's quite interesting. So we've been doing a lot of work around the digital economy because what COVID did is it accelerated the adoption of uh, digital technology, as you know. Yeah. And we looked at what, do, what are companies looking for? And Ernest, I can tell you now that what companies are looking for versus what is available in the economy, chalk and cheese, yeah. right? There's a, a huge and growing need for digital skills, both soft, or simple digital skills to very technical, very, um, you know, um, uh, yeah, technical uh, digital skills. And, and what we've then seen is that it's actually very easy to convert a matriculant to become a coder. I didn't know this. I thought you had to go to university and do a computer science degree or do a software engineering degree or an information uh, technology degree. You actually mm -hmm. don't need to do that. You can do a coding course for 12 months, uh, or so. So you can convert somebody who's a matriculant who's been working at Checkers as a cashier, put them on a nine to 12 month coding program, and at the end of that period, they can be employed uh, you know, in, in, in the digital space, where whether it's yeah. in, in the technology space or even in banking, because they're looking for data scientists and data analytics and all those other things. So what we have found is that if we can focus firstly on being deliberate about bringing up our digital skills. It is said that artificial intelligence alone can grow our economic productivity by 40% uh, by 2035. By just doing these things, you, yeah. you, you know what I'm saying? So, so, so the skills and the type of skills, very, very important. And I think it cannot be government should do it. it. It has to be us as corporate South Africa in every area where we operate, we need to do it. And it doesn't matter what sector you are in. Every yeah. business, country and in, in the world is going to need digital skills and I think that just was can I just quickly answer, would you would you agree that this tethers into the policy um, uncertainty debate or conversation we just had earlier on um, this just what you just mentioned Absolutely. I, I, th I think uh, a lot of it you know it's actually quite sad because we do a lot of work here I mean the president has got the the, the fourth industrial Revol revolution uh, revolution commission Mm. Beautiful work coming out of that, right? Beautiful work coming out of that. And uh, that we're making all manner of statements again. Uh, but what is our policy and what are we doing on the ground? So policy certainty is not only about what does a piece of paper say as a country, yeah. be, but it also then talks to because the enabling arm of government is, is institutions. Yeah. So you then have to look at the institutional capability of the enabling, yeah. you know, of, 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 of the state to say, do the CETAs then have the capacity to do this training that the skills development strategy says we should do and, and, and things like that. And the Fire Act Commission is also recommending that we do, right? Yeah. And also then talk to even things like the regulatory environment. Understanding that the Fire Act is here, does our regulatory environment respond to that and recognize that? And are we ready to yeah. do commercial activity within the digital technology? Are we sufficiently uh, protected other regulations responsive to this new way of doing things. Uh, so, so, so also not just regulatory certainty, but also um, a harmonious 
um, implementation of it. So where the regulators understand what the legislation is seeking to achieve and what yeah. it is saying, so that when we come up with a, a, a white paper or whatever paper or green paper, then the regulator is already changing either their own regulations to enable what the legislation is saying, but also our CETAs and similar institutions, and, yeah. as I said, enabling arms of, of government, also are, 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 you know, are, fall, fall into line with what the policy is saying. So absolutely. But I do think that, um, you know, because government moves at the pace that it does, we as a private sector can move very, very nimbly. And I don't think that we have got the luxury of sitting here and, and nearly saying policy uncertainty, therefore, because yeah. who's at stake, right? So yeah. I am an employer, I'm an entrepreneur and I'm an employer. Already, I have started training my team uh, to make sure that they have got the necessary, we call it having dual qualifications today. You will yeah. not survive in the next five to 10 years time in the work environment if you do not have dual qualifications. Am I gonna wait for government to go and do that? I'm not gonna do that. I've already uh, started making the, the investment and I think we can all do that. And it doesn't cost as much money as we think it, it does. And it doesn't take as much time as we think it does. So I think that there are those immediate things that we can do as a private sector, of course, engaging with government and helping them to catch up, but government is likely to have to play a catch up role. I don't think they're gonna, <laughs> we have to be the pathfinders and then they'll just find us along the way. I also think that, and, and the important, importance by the way of this thing around skills is that it then starts addressing the issue of unemployment, but importantly, and uh, very importantly is that it starts becoming the pipeline for your technology businesses because I mean, we a lot in the technology startup space. And the one thing that we have struggled with uh, over the past few years as we've been investing in tech startups is the lack of quality tech skills. You know, So a lot of the time, the tech businesses that we end up investing in, you find that the proprietors have come up with the idea and the minimum viable product, but actually somebody else is doing the technology build up for them. So from a business model perspective going forward, it's not really ideal for you to run a tech business, but you don't have the tech skills internally. So yeah. once you flood the market, once you flood the market with digital technology skills, then it means that firstly, out of those guys with those skills, you're gonna start having real tech startups run by real techies. But importantly, we can start feeding those skills into either tech startups so that we can build the capability of those businesses and importantly uh, get those skills into big corporate where you start seeing big corporate starting to innovate because big corporate has been very complacent and lazy and not really creating anything new. So yeah. once they come, then that's when big corporate can start reinventing itself and start uh, hopefully being innovative uh, and, and, being, and continue to because big corporate is also starting to be irrelevant. Uh, it's only the guys who have embraced technology and are putting technology at the center of their business models that are finding ways of re reinventing themselves as a, as a way and therefore remaining irrelevant. Yeah. So I think that's that. And, and then of course, taking an ecosystem approach to this. So my view is look at the skills, um, create an environment that is supportive of tech startups and, 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 and things like that, absorb uh, the people that come out of that as employees or as, as businesses. Uh, but I think importantly, again, when I say ecosystem, have the funding. So now that you've created a population of potential tech startups, where is the seed funding, right? Where is the venture capital funding? Uh, um, you know, do we have an ecosystem that understands that there's this new pipeline that is coming up that will be in need of this kind of ecosystem? So over and above the funding, then the business support, because if you're going to build a business, you need different people uh, plugging into that to help you. You know, you, you need someone who's gonna help you figure out how to build a team. You need someone who's gonna help you figure out how your go-to-market strategy, your growth plan, you know, and, and things like that. So, so being very deliberate as a country, so almost deciding as a country that we're gonna be an entrepreneurially driven uh, country uh, looking at innovating and creating centers of excellence. So if we can agree to that as a collective, it becomes easy to then say, let us set up the ecosystem. It, mm -hmm. It's there, but it's disjointed and it doesn't work very well. And it needs to be supported uh, better and, and, and properly. So, so I think those are the types of things that certainly we are 
thinking a lot about and working very hard on. And I think that's that's where I think we can get very quick with. And what I've described now might sound like it's complex. It's not complex. It's really very simple things. And we can get immediate wins uh, with these things because we don't have the luxury of saying, let's do it today. We will see the results in three years' time. We want to do it today and see the results in six months' time and in 12 months' time. And then other stuff we can still do and see the results in three, months, in three yeah. years. We have to do things that will give us immediate returns because the situation is very, very dire. Uh, and, and unemployment rate, even though we're saying it's 23, I think we all know that it's two, right? So, um, so, so I think uh, we, we, you know, we, we our problems uh, are such that we don't have the luxury of of looking only long term. We have to do immediate term, medium term, and long term kind of interventions. Yeah, Polo, thank you so much. This was deeply educational uh, for both myself and I'm sure everyone else who was listening in. We are about 55 minutes in on this webinar and I'd like to let you go. Thank you so much for honoring the invitation, not just this invitation, but participating in the first interview, um, which featured, which led to the report being written. Um, I'd like to wish you well in all of your endeavors and all of the businesses and entrepreneurs that you do continue supporting. Um, I'd also like to thank the, both the teams at eSquared and IntelliDex um, for their work in producing both this uh, report and this webinar series. Um, we'd like to invite everyone to stay in touch with, with us through our social media channels and website for more projects that we have in the future. Um, have a good day, Bolo and everyone. Bye-bye. Um, thank you very much. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.